Hi, welcome to the Wave Function Collapser video documentation. I'm going to start by looking at the Colors example, which you can get to by clicking the Colors example button at the Help page. If you run this, you'll see a big grid of tiles um, with a bunch of options in each one. And you can select one of these options, and it has all these effects on neighboring tiles. So actually, the grid cells I'll refer to as slots in the wave function collapse terms. And all of the different options in each slots I'll refer to as a module. The idea being that any slot can have any of the modules that are still present in its option set. So for example, this one can have this module assigned to it. Um, but now the thing below it only has a few choices because it's been constrained by the modules that have been assigned to neighboring slots. So you can go through and select which modules you want to apply in each spot. You can also remove certain module possibilities. So over here, I'll remove the sky by right clicking. And you can see that that also propagates changes to neighboring slots. You can go ahead and solve the entire grid by clicking the collapse all button, and it will take whatever constraints you've given it so far and um, solve the rest of the puzzle, if you will. The reset button will bring you back to the beginning. Play with it in a different way, maybe. Come up with a different initial setup. And you can use the Collapse 1 button, and it will pick the lowest entropy slot and collapse its module superposition to just one. OK, so let's try and recreate this example from scratch. So I'll go ahead and make a new scene. And the first thing that I will do is right click on my hierarchy and create a Brood Inc. WFC 2D grid renderer. This is mostly a utility proof app that you can use to help visualize 2D wave function collapse states. It needs a configuration file, which we don't have yet. So that's the next thing we need to do. Right click on my assets, and I'll create a Brood Inc. WFC sprite sheet config. There are a few other ones that other videos will go into, and you can even create your own configs. But for now, the sprite sheet config. OK, so the configuration file has a lot of stuff in it. It has some initial metadata, including the width and height of the grid. So I'll right away assign those to 10. Don't forget to set your width and height. Otherwise, um, you won't see anything when you run it. Now, the sprite sheet configuration, its job is to create a bunch of modules given a sprite sheet in Unity. And it's also going to create a bunch of constraints on how those modules can exist next to each other. It's going to infer the constraints based on neighboring edge colors. So let's start by adding a sprite sheet. I'll use the Add Sprite Sheet button and scroll down to a sprite sheet that I've prepared that we used in the last example. Once I do that, I see a whole bunch of blue squares. Um, there's a lot of sky tile duplication in the sprite sheet, but later on I can see that there are, in fact, other sprites in here. I'm going to spend some time and remove all of the duplicated sky tiles. Now that I've cleaned up the sprites that exist, let's take a focus on the Simple World Tiles 9. You can see that there are four red dots on the edges. These signify where the sprite is being sampled along each edge. And the idea here is that this module can only exist next to another module that has the same color pattern along any corresponding edge. So let's take the right edge, for example. Right now, the sampled color is green. We can see that by this thing here. This means that this can only live in a slot where there's still a possibility that the rightwards module could have a green left edge. Now, that's a lot to digest, but for example, it could live to the right of Simple World Tiles 10, because this green edge lines up with this green edge. But the Simple World Tiles 9 could not live to the right of the Simple World Tiles 8, because this blue does not line up with this green. However, one sample is not going to cut it. We can see pretty quickly if we scroll down that this doesn't work so much. So there are some settings at the top that let us configure how these samples are done. The first thing is to change all of the sample padding properties. Right now, the textures are being sampled right on their edges, which in sprite sheets can often produce texture bleed. So 
I'll start by using a seven pixel padding. You can see that that brings in all of the red dots a little bit from their edges. The next thing is that one sample is not going to cut it. I'm actually going to increase the number of samples used to four in this particular case. And I can now see that this does a pretty good job of capturing the state. And I'll just scroll down and sort of make sure that things visually line up. All right, so things look pretty good. Just a couple other properties to talk about before leaving the configuration. There's the sample spacing ratio. Take a look at these red dots. You can see as I increase the ratio, they get farther apart from each other. And if I decrease the ratio, they get closer together. This can be useful for fine tuning where the samples are being taken from. I'll leave it at one. Then the sample spacing offset allows you to slide them back and forth. Again, also just useful for fine tuning. I'll leave that at zero. All right, so now that we've created our configuration, let's go back to the prefab that we've made and let's assign our configuration and then take a look at the final product. So we can see that we have a 10 by 10 grid with all sorts of module options at each slot location. And let's start uh, collapsing the wave state. So I can make some selections here and those changes propagate, can collapse the lowest entropy slots and now I'll just decide to solve the rest of the grid. And there we go.